Romans chapter 6. And we'll start at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in it? Know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For we, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in its lust. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those who are alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. <clears throat> in, the, uh, in Romans 5, where we're just leaving, we have the presentation of his love and we have his death for us. And we have all of that because of his love and because of a desire that is within him to even conceive of such a plan, to even conceive of such a plan, to bring us to him. And in the second half, we are, we are presented with oneness so that his love is not just seen in terms of in terms of getting rid of sins or in terms of just destroying something but in terms of oneness in terms of bringing us into something and that something is him it's not just some new Christian religion. And I mean, if, if we could understand that, it would change our life. But it's not just trying to give us a new religion and give us a new way of seeing things and making us more godly so that we're, you know, really holy, rather that we're holy His. And that that comes by that oneness. And... Um, that in truth, all, all fruitfulness and all growth and all, all that is going to come to us is going to come to us by that oneness. It doesn't come, there is no, there is no other basis. Um, in other words, there is no um, there is no Christian doctrine or Christianity <clears throat> that's going to change anything. 
It is not the doctrine of Christ that does anything. It's Christ. And it is the, the beauty that he is that should move us and not just some doctrine of what he's done or something that he will do or something that is sure to come to pass because we're now Christians. But our hope is him. It's not, it's not what he does or what he's going to do. It's not, it's not a work. It is the work, and he's the work of God. I mean, he is the work that God wanted to bring about by the cross of bringing us, as it were, and, and as it is truly understood through <clears throat> the captivity and through the Day of Atonement and through um, uh, Genesis, where we've studied this ancient pattern, Adam and Eve, originally his, then not his. And then in Romans, the return, the return, the return. So, uh, to, to contemplate these things with our hearts instead of with trying to grasp truths and, and um, trying to become something apart from Jesus, which is just utterly ridiculous, <laughs> just ridiculous. Like he's the, you know, that scripture in the book of Revelation says, Behold, I make all things new. And we go, oh, good, make me new. No, no, he's saying anything that's joined to him is made new. And the newness of it is him. We're old. Y'all are looking at me going, yeah. But that's, but he's, he is the new. It's not, you know, I was saying this in, in Arizona, you know, you have all these detergents and food and everything else that says new and improved. Well, which is it? Yeah. New is new and improved is old made better. I'm going with new. I don't want the improved version of, of me or anything else. I want Jesus, because he's the new of it. And when he said that, all heaven should have, and earth should have shouted with glory. Behold, he makes it new. And yet we read right over it and go, okay, well, just make some new things then. He didn't say I make new things. He says I make, I'm what makes them new. So there is this, um, there is this clash that starts immediately between Romans 5 and Romans 6. Immediate clash, an immediate contrast, an immediate uh, abrupt change from Romans 5 with, with his much more heart and with his love uh, that is not like human love, that is not like human love, that is not like human love that would maybe die for somebody that was really worth it, but how many of us are really worth it? Um, there is a deep clash, a contrast, an abrupt turnabout from Romans 5 to Romans 6. It's clearly seen in the last verse of Romans 5 and the first verse of Romans 6. Verse 21 of Romans 5. And that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so grace reigned through righteousness under eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, we should have read 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. 
And you have this wonderful ending of Romans 5 that is all about Jesus and his love, all about his heart, all about his giving, all about his selflessness. And then we are immediately confronted. But what shall we say then? Shall we? What shall we say? Shall what? Shall we continue? God forbid you're dead. We go, well, shall we continue and say, you shouldn't continue at all. Shall we? But he, I like it. He says, we, us, all of us. All of us, shall we? God forbid. What is, on what basis does God forbid us to continue in sin? The basis is not because he forbids it. I forbid it. I'm God. No. The basis is we're dead with Christ. The cross is real. The cross works. The cross is powerful. That's the basis Paul saw the first generation, the first they all received this and they all and it changed the world. But now it's all watered down and now it's just Oh, well, God forbid sin. So no, 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 don't do it anymore. Don't do that and don't do this with no power at all. And nothing of Jesus except for the fact that he forbids it. Well, he forbids it, so you shouldn't be doing that. No, no, he doesn't forbid it again because he doesn't like it. He forbids it because we're dead. God forbid. How is it possible how shall we that are dead continue? That's, that's the abrupt change. The abrupt change moves from all that Jesus does and all that his heart says and all that he reached out and all that he poured out and now it turns to us and it says, okay, your turn. What's your reaction to this chapter five beauty? What is, what is it? And everybody gets to make their own decision. Everybody gets to choose. Christ crucified in his beauty that saves me from sin. Choose that alone. Or me crucified with that same Christ who died. And that's the challenge of chapter 6. Because it is rounding out the ground for oneness. Isn't it? It really is. If you know that chapter, it is, it is saying, yeah, it's all a free gift, but guess what? There's, there's more that happened at that cross than just you get everything. I wrote down in Romans 5, we are presented with his selflessness. In Romans 6, we are confronted with our selfishness. Hmm. So in Romans, up to this point, there have really not been any obstacles. It's just been facts in the first couple of chapters, and then Jesus doing everything. No obstacles. But for the first time, we face our first obstacle to gain oneness, the first obstacle to gain oneness, and it's our death to self. Our death. It's an obstacle, isn't it? It is. Even the very teaching of it can Confront, and that's the word I use. I said in, we were presented in chapter 5 with his selflessness, but we are confronted in chapter 6 with our selfishness. Will we realize? Will we embrace? You, you're not going to embrace unless you realize what the issues are. You're not. You're going to try. You're going to say, oh, I do embrace. Yes, oh, 
there has to be a, a, a realization, there has to be a realization as if you stepped out of one room called Romans 5 with all of its beauty and stepped into another room called Romans 6 and you realize I must pass through this room and Romans 7 if I'm going to get to Romans 8. Got to do it. If you're going to do it. You understand what I mean? But if, but if not, you don't even, you can ignore that door. You can ignore that room. Paul talks about in Galatians where he, he talks about the door of faith. And that's what he's talking about. He's talking about entering in to the cross. And there you are a child of Abraham. There you are of the faith of Abraham, who considered himself dead, had no hope in himself. Was that sound familiar? Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Not you alive, not me, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ, who is our life and who is our future, but he's our present, but he's more than our future and our present. He is the I am, and, and we don't always recognize him in that. We recognize him more as the I do, the great I do, and that's why we go to that throne room of grace, and that's why we spend so much time praying over something that should have been crucified and, and getting him to patch it up and fix it up and just, oh, just help me, Lord Jesus. And he's going, I'm trying to help you to the cross. I'm trying to help you to oneness with me because that's how you got to the cross, through oneness. Did you know that? That's how you got there. You said, I will be one with you. You didn't go, oh, you know, and go throw your hands around Jesus and go, oh, Jesus, you know, I'm one with you. You had to first, we became one with him in the garden of Gethsemane. And there he took us to the cross. And there we died. And then we rose. You remember the chart, you know, the square and the circle with the cross in between? Anybody remember that? With the bullet holes? You remember that? It's not a chart. It's an eternal reality. It's an eternal thing of his heart. It's just a thing, unless you see his heart. And then you just go, you know what? If this is, if this is, what, if this is what you want, you, then you, as it were, oneness, you throw your arms around and say, take me with you. But I'm going to the cross, sweetheart. <laughs> I'm heading to the cross. Are you with me? She goes, uh, no, I didn't know that's where we were going. I didn't know what it was going to cost. You know, and that's what most people see in, in Romans 6, the cost. So they avoid it and they just go right over, you know. Oh, let's go to Romans 8. There is no Romans 8 for you or for me without Romans 6 and 7. There isn't. There isn't. We can claim, oh, there's no more condemnation as we, you know, sit under condemnation. You know, always wrestling with condemnation because it's still us. Yeah. And we are worthy of death right. instead of dead. Do you see the difference? We're worthy. We're still worthy of death. We're still in a wrong place. We're in ourself. We're not in him. Paul said, being found in him. I want you to look around, and if you find me, I want to be found in him. That's where I want to be found. But, but as Romans 6 is trying to explain and communicate and breathe forth to us, if you love that Jesus that is so beautifully set forth in Romans 5, 
to marry that one, you're going to have to become one. And to become one, he's going to take you to Calvary. But he takes you, my God, he takes us with him. He doesn't just send us to the cross. He takes us. He is, he is always ready to give himself. He never hesitates about giving himself. And so we throw ourselves back and repelled by it, by the thought of it, never considering the one that would take us there and bring us through. I never see that. We just see the cross. We, again, we see the cost and we go... I don't know, I don't want to give up this, and I don't want to give up that. In other words, is that how, much, how much worth is that to you compared to him? We say he's not, it's not worthy to be compared. Well, we do it all the time. We compare and we choose, we choose our, what we like, what, what, what makes us comfortable, what we've had that we think, I wrote down, will we realize and embrace that we died in those burnt stones? We'll see that a little more as we go. <clears throat> will we want him on that basis or will we turn away? The cross basis. The basis that, you know, I mean, it is, it is absolutely true to say if you go this route, you will lose everything. But it's also right to say you'll gain him, which is way more than anything, or all of it put together. But who can convince anyone of that? Really? I mean, really, you know? <clears throat> I mean, see, that's why I think the Holy Spirit led Paul to put down you know, Romans 3 and 4 and 5, and especially 5 first, so that we could see the precious one that we would be with if we'll just go through Romans 6. In other words, he could have just hid him from us and then just told us, go with this guy. You don't need to know who he is. He might be a jerk. Who knows? But it, it paints this in, in Romans 5 so beautifully. The first half is this love and, 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 and how he, by love, died for us. Even the ungodly, even the worst. And then it, it, it reveals his heart. I just want to make you one with me. That's all. That's a, what's your agenda, mister? I just want to make you one with me. That's all. How, explain what that means and where, how that's going to, what am I going to get out of it? You know? I mean, I think, honestly, I think we slap him in the face all the time and we don't even know it. I do. I think because we're so contrary and we're so not wired the way he is that we continually abuse the Lord. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I believe that. I believe that we think we're okay and we don't even know how much, how far from conformity to Christ that we are so that we just, just go our merry way and boom, and just trample Love, that's a song I wrote some time back. Trample even love. That's the words to that. We trample, which implies we trample a lot of other stuff, but we trample even love. Romans 6 is an unveiling. That's what I began to see as I meditated on 
on these words. It is, it is so easy. It's so easy to have been, quote unquote, in this message for years to just go right into Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8 and just get all our little great little teachings and never see his heart. And that's what I've been seeing is his heart. Even in Romans 6 and 7. In Roman, even more in Romans 7. It's incredible. It's not a light thing. We'll get there. And if I keep talking, we might get there tonight. It's an unveiling. The revelation that when, when the first goat died, they have atonement. That we do. The discovery that return from captivity equals we died with old Jerusalem. It's the revelation of the answers of the captivity and of the day of atonement. Return from captivity is not just leaving a place. Because they were in Babylon, you know. Or how about, how about, how about Israel in Egypt? And they left Egypt, but e Egypt never left them. Because it's not leaving a place, you know. It's not. Return from captivity is this glorious reality of Romans 6, 7, and 8. the noonday sun. I wrote down, it's a return to burnt stones. It's, it's a return to bone. It is Israel coming back and making a journey because something was in their heart and they realized that what they had before was not it, and God put it away and put them in captivity, all oh, put them in a safe place until. Yeah. And they, I can, you know, I can just see them returning, and they kind of know things, and the Spirit's on them, and the Lord's with them, but they get there. And they see those burnt stones and they just, they just come down and they hold them and they go, this is my death with him. He's not the only one who died. I thought, he, I thought Jerusalem was the only one who died and we, we escaped. This is my precious death with Jesus. This is, this is holy ground. It's a return of a living goat. The return of a living goat embracing his, his death with the first goat. Isn't it? Isn't it? It's the return of the scapegoat that comes out of Babylon, that comes out of a place not inhabited and says, that death was my death. I don't want to live without him. I don't want to live in a land inhabited. I don't want to wander the wilderness. I don't want to be this way anymore. I want to return. But the goat you're returning to was put to death. And that's your death. So what is it? It's a, it is a, it is Romans 6, it is a revelation of the true meaning of these things. When Christ died, you died. Cap those in captivity, when Christ died, you died. When Jerusalem died, you died. Those that represent that goat that was released, you, you say, well, again, we talked about this before, there's no mention of that goat returning, not in the, not in the early part of the, 
The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, not in the dawn light, it's not. But when you see it in the pattern over and over and over, it does because it has to. It, if not, there's nothing left. It's just one goat dead and the other one out wandering in the wilderness. It's just, it's just Jerusalem destroyed and everybody else in captivity. That, that's the end. But always that ancient path is that there's a return of a remnant. Always. And, it's, and Romans 6 is the noonday sun of that picture, vague picture, at the dawning of the early part of the Bible. So let's look at uh, Romans 6, 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. Isn't it interesting, the wordings of the Bible, isn't it interesting that that the Spirit of God so intimately knows Jesus, so incredibly wants to communicate, is sent with a mission to declare, and the joy of his heart, the joy of his heart, not just to put it in Scripture, even though to him it's so plain and us it's so hard to see. But to find just one heart, just one heart that he can talk plainly. I mean, what is the value of that to him? What is the value of that to you? Do you have one person you can just say anything and not have to worry about it, but it, this is the communication of hearts. This is, it's not, this is not jabbering. This is not mixed conversation that you can speak and the other person knows what you're saying because you're on the, it's the same. What a, what a blessing that we could give to the Holy Spirit to just be open, you know, to just be open. He'll do a lot of the talking. <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. You go, well, I, don't, I don't know if I have that much to say. Just let him talk. It'll get in you. It'll get in you. And he'll, it'll be thrilling because he's just thrilled us to declare the Lord. So Romans 6, 4. <clears throat> buried by baptism into death. Hmm, it doesn't say buried by baptism into dirt. Burial, dirt. Burial, dirt. Isn't that what we think? Burial into him. Baptized into him. Even as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. See, it didn't say you were raised. It says you walk in the raised life. If as Christ was raised, you walk in a new life. The word newness there in the Spanish is just what, Patty? New life. <laughs> Vida Nueva, new life, a new life, not newness, new him, not improved, a new life. So for us, the resurrection is the new life. It is. It says, as Christ was raised, you walk in that. That's resurrection. 
We go, no, no, resurrection is me getting up. Don't, please, don't get up. <laughs> it's not us. It's not him doing something to us so we can get up. It's him raised and us walking in that new life. And now that's our resurrection. Oh, it seemed to me like I heard Jesus say something like that. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You ain't getting to the Father except by me. Excuse that Texas translation. But is that right? You're not going to go to the Father by you. Oh, no, I am now. He's made me. I'm part of the family. You're not part of the family unless you're part of the DNA. And don't give me that adoption stuff because you don't understand biblical adoption if you go there with that because it is not earthly human adoption. <laughs> There, I wrote, there's no other return from captivity. It is a return to what always was intended by God. Always, from before the foundation of the world. Union into death to gain union into his life. In verse 11, likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead. How, how do you do that? I mean, I vaguely remember the process as I was starting out because I kept, I kept saying, okay, I reckon I'm dead then. It's the only way a Texan knows how to reckon yourself dead. I reckon I'm dead. Well, he said I'm dead. I reckon I'm dead. Uh, no. You know, you can go over, you can read that scripture over and over until your eyeballs fall out on the page and until the Holy Spirit shows you that how do you, how do you know that you're dead? Because Jesus died. Because you were in him. Because if you say you're not dead, then you say he's not dead. Well, well then how am I supposed to how am I supposed to get this? You're supposed to seek the Holy Spirit in the Word to open your eyes to such a degree that the light of the knowledge of the glory of God begins to change you from glory to glory so that your consciousness is saturated so much so, just like this ground here, you know. Here's, here's what I, you know, I... I don't claim to be a praying man, but I talk to God all the time. <laughs> okay, I don't claim to be, but I am constantly like, okay. And all this rain that we're having, and, and uh, they said that, you know, yeah, all the lakes are full. Lake, what, Lake Texoma was 20 feet above normal. And I said, Lord, why, why are we having all this rain? He said, because you were in drought for so long. He said, because it was so dry and so little life was able to spring forth and just so dry for so long that you think when you pray, Lord, oh, I'm so dry. Oh, Lord, bring me back to freshness. You know, that's kind of some sort of weird, I don't know, you know, oh, just... You know, sprinkle a little in you. Oh, yeah, that's so good. <laughs> you know, moisturize me. No, 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 no. When the way that he does it 
is if you're that dry, if you're that dry in drought conditions, he has to flood you so much until you're saturated again. And then it will go back down to, to you know, it's like a, like a, a, a seesaw, you know, and you're way dry over here. So he's got to just flood you to get it over here so that then that can soak in and then you can come back to normalcy. But we, we just want him to rein us up to, you know, a certain point where we think this is good. This is, uh, you know, and he's not. And he's going to flood you and you're going to feel like you're going to be drowning. And there are people going, Lord, stop the rain. He knows when to stop it. And it does. And, and it'll, that flood will start moving stuff. You know, I don't know if I mentioned this, but where I walk Rocky, normally the very path that I take him on, the big field and all of this kind of stuff, there are huge, big old barrels where they, they're put oil and gas and stuff in those things. Big old, I mean, huge. I mean, probably from that wall to here, maybe, and then around, there were two of them sitting there. And the day after the floods in Crum went down, Rocky and I are down there walking, and I look over, and those things are gone, and the walls that held them in are crushed down, and the concrete is pulled up. You want something moved in you? You need to quit just playing at it. You know, quit playing at it. Just, you know, oh, just splash a oh, I feel, I feel fresher now, you know, all that junk. Man, you don't, this ain't about you feeling fresh. This is about removing the drought. And then moving stuff that needed to be moved out of the way, and only these floodwaters can do it. But we, you know what, Lord, it's getting scary. <laughs> like the other night, we had a tornado. I don't know if y'all knew it. We had a tornado heading straight for Crumb. It says it's in the it's in the rain. You won't see it. And it's and it's on you. And the sirens are going off. Well, actually, before the sirens are going off. I'm saying I, I need to get out here and stand in between that tornado and this place. I know, that's stupid. Went out there, I'm standing there, and I'm just enjoying the heck out of it. And this, you know, it's, they'd already said it's on the ground and it's right there. You can't see it. But I'm standing there, and I'm just like, wow, look at this. And you could just feel the power in this thing. And, and the lightning was just like amazing. I mean, in, my, in the 60s, I've seen some amazing light shows. This thing is just like, oh, this was, this was the top. It was just like going all like this and the, all the power and the wind. And the, it's just like all just like this. And I just went, oh, my God. I saw the awesome power of God. No. Not in all of that, but that my father has all that power and, he, and Jesus has all that power and he chooses to be a lamb and not just wipe us all out. And I'm standing there and the alarms go off. I'm just going, I wish I would quit. I'm enjoying this, you know. And I felt the presence of God felt the presence of God. I'm not, I'm not into tempting God. I felt the presence of God. My wife sticks her head out, goes, uh, I, think it's, <laughs> I think it's time to come in. Because I told her, go get in the closet. <laughs> and she's wondering where I am. So she comes all through the house. And, is he under the bed? <laughs> and I'm out there standing there going, this is pretty cold. <laughs> yeah, it actually did turn. It didn't hit crumb. And the whole storm even went around us. But, you know, 
there's just this there's just this reality that we want to find God in you know helping and refreshing us when he says if you want me to help your drought I'm going to have to saturate you so much so you need to be willing to be given over to that are you willing Okay, well, being willing isn't enough. You have to move your will. You do. You have to say, okay, normally right now I would do this or that, but I am going to seek you, Lord. But you're not going to just go, okay, I'm seeking you. Look, hey, I'm reading here. See that? Do some good stuff. You have to say, you are my chief desire. You are my beloved. You are my joy. You are, you know, I mean, like, like Paul right here in Romans. What is it? At the end of Romans 11, when he's just been hearing from the Spirit and writing all this stuff down, he goes, oh, the, oh, the depth, both of the height and the glory of God. And he just, he just you know, I mean, you don't normally write like that. You know what I mean? You go, and the Lord's a da 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 unless the Lord's all over you while you're writing, and all of a sudden you're not no longer writing the thing that he's given you. You're just going, oh, my God, you're so, so incredible. And I just, you know, later you go, well, I wonder if I'm supposed to add that in, you know, <laughs> all generations to read, or, you know, that was kind of, that's kind of me just going off there. To reckon yourself dead is a bookkeeping term, an auditor type term in the, in the Greek. And it means like a, a bookkeeper's keeping the books and, it's, and, and I don't know how all of them work, but I know I used to do that for Avis Rent-A-Car. What you did was you had a line going this way with the information on that one, and then a line underneath for the next one, and then the next one, and the next one, the next one, the next one. But then there were also lines with mileage and amounts and gas and you know, all this kind of stuff that went this way. But anyway, when it got done, everything over here in this corner should add up to the same thing. No matter how you do it, it should all come to the same number. And if it doesn't, in my case, if it didn't, I had to fill in, you know. Ah, we're 20 bucks short. Well, we can't fill in on this number. This number adds up to you're dead, and I'm dead because Jesus died. And I remember going through the process, and it was, it was constant for a while there, I would have to go in my head, I'd go, you know, I'd, I would go, am I dead? And then I'd have to answer myself and go, did Jesus die? And then I'd go, yes, he died. And then go, did you die with him? Yes. Then are you dead? I'm dead. So I'm doing the chart thing, and I'm doing, you know. And, and I would have to do it over and over because I'd go, well, am I dead? But I did it because I was trying to saturate my mind with the reality that I am dead with Christ. That if he's dead, if he's really, if Jesus really died, every Christian believes, you know, I got the cross. Every Christian believes he, he really did die. But do we believe we died with him? But it doesn't leave it at that. Likewise... Reckon yourself alive unto God through Jesus, not through you. You're not going to reckon yourself alive unto God through Jesus unless you're not in the equation. Right? Because if you're in the equation, then you're going to include you in that. And therefore, you're going to reckon yourself alive unto God by you or with the help of Jesus. I'm alive unto God by the... No, no, no. 
you are not alive unto God by the help of Jesus. <laughs> he, he made sure that you would not be alive unto God with his help called Calvary. And that's where you believe him. And that's where the struggle ends. And that's where everything that comes along after that is seen in light of the word. It's seen in light of the cross. It's seen in light of the spirit of God. It's seen in light of the truth as it is in Jesus. And it builds in you a foundation built on Christ and him crucified. It builds something in you. Well, the interesting thing, and I'll wrap it up a little early. The interesting thing is Romans 6 is sort of presented as doctrine. Sort of. It's not, but it's sort of presented as doctrine. Romans 7 is proof whether you got it or not. Oh, wretched man that I am. You remember Romans 7? All that floundering. Well, how can you flounder after having Romans 6 presented to you? Because you didn't reckon on it. You didn't get the cross clearly enough. But there's actually one more thing that we'll talk about when we get to Romans 8 that is not mentioned in Romans 6 and 7, but it is the answer to Romans 7. And it is the fulfillment of the Day of Atonement. Anyway, okay, so let's take a break. And, uh, and when we come back, we're going to go to Romans 7.